Good evening and welcome. I'm really looking forward to this evening and I'm really looking forward to exploring the choices that we have looking at harnesses or patient jackets for canine hydrotherapy. There's a chat just to your right, so please do add in any questions you want to go um, as we go along and I'll try and deal with all of those as we go along and at the end as well. So my background is I'm a chartered physiotherapist, um, qualified in 1982 and uh, really enjoyed my hydrotherapy, my musculoskeletal and manual handling and orthopedic and then I specialised as a neurophysio. And then I changed career. I kind of moved into veterinary physiotherapy. So my passion are dogs. And I completed my master's at the Royal Veterinary College in 2002. And I was the first accredited clinical educator in veterinary physiotherapy in the UK. And I love sharing the clinical techniques that we use um, to people who share my passion and are very dog centric. So looking at the question, we're thinking about flotation jackets and harnesses to really, oops, hi Christy, really, sorry Crystal. It is recorded, you, do, you can go to daycare, you can drop off, don't worry, it is recorded as well. So to find out the decisions, we really need to go and have a deep dive into science and look at the facts. So I'm just going to, there we go, bring up the PowerPoint, which has just got us some pictures in there, which I think will help reinforce some of the things we're going to talk about. So canine biomechanics is so exciting because the facts and the information that we've known for such a long time tie in brilliantly with finding out what, um, what works best for the dog and what helps the dog improve the fastest, which is what we're all concerned with. So if you have a little look at the skeleton here, the skeleton, the dog has four legs as it's a quadruped and they're about supporting the dog, We've got two main reasons, supporting the dog against gravity and for acceleration. Um, the joints of the dog are loose links and because they're loose links, they need extra stabilizing structures. But what they do is they give the dog opportunity to have lots of postures like lying, sitting. So with that compromise, and it's a great design feature, we do need some extra stabilizing structures on those. And what I really enjoy is um, sharing um, stories and I've got a great car analogy that works for me and I've been sharing to explain canine biomechanics in a nutshell. So looking at this wonderful Bracco, Bracco Italiano here, we've just got the silhouette there. Um, we're looking at that this animal is a digigrade animal. So you are, you and I are plantigrade. So if you lift your heels up into the air and go onto the balls of your feet, that is the dog's natural balance stance. Um, the dog distributes two thirds of its weight over its forelimbs and a third over its hind limbs. And in natural balance stance, that's the distribution, but as soon as the dog moves out of balance or moves its head or goes into movement, obviously that's going to distribute because we have 30% on both forelimbs and 20% on both hind limbs. So when you think about all the dogs that we care for in our professional care, there's a huge range of different breed shapes. And this is really significant with canine biomechanics because dogs have got more variation in their head shape, body shape and proportions than any other species, any other mammal on the planet. So think of your mini Daxi. Um, it's like a long backed mini truck. And think of the elite sprint athlete, the Greyhound, that's like your Ferrari. So when you think of all the cars or motor vehicles you've seen over the last couple of days, dogs are like that too. They come in all shapes and sizes. It's not just a sizing issue, which is really rare. And it's a challenge for us because what's normal for one dog movement wise is abnormal for the other. So when we're looking at the skeleton, the skeleton represents the car chassis. It's fantastic to give a framework to support structures for attachment, to protect vital organs and for storage of minimal, minerals. But there's absolutely no power of movement from the, the skeleton. So the chassis of your car, you can polish it all you like. It isn't going to move anywhere. Now, if you have a look at the joints, they represent the wheels of the car. And the design feature for these is that they actually have a design feature to encourage forward motion. So the dog is designed, like your car, 
to go forward in a straight line is the easiest. It can do maneuvering, but starting movement, braking and turning are much more complex patterns. And you'll often hear that where owners reflect and say, once my dog gets moving in a straight line, it's not too bad. It's the rising in the morning, getting in the car. So the joints represent the wheels and they're in a complex linkage. Just lost my arrow there in a minute. So those that know me know this is a huge challenge for me. I love dogs. I love teaching and training. I love sharing clinical skills, but probably my IT skills are the area that I keep working on and try and improve. So natural balance stance and natural balance motion is what therapists are really interested in. And so we need to know where does the power of movement come because there's no power from a joint and there's no power from the skeleton. So the power of movement, the engine for the dog is the muscle system. And the muscle system, the muscle system is, um, is a complex system. So if you think about standing up on one leg, a lot of muscles, their main function is to keep part of you stabilized while the other part moves the, moves the limb. So the muscles are the engine of the car and they don't turn on without command. So if you think of your car outside on your garage or in the garage, it doesn't, the engine doesn't come on spontaneously. It's definitely commanded by a very important system called the proprioceptive system. We we'll just go, whoops. There we go. So we know from research that canine locomotion is the product of two things. It's the product of the proprioceptive system and of muscle power. And this um, Professor McNeil Alexander has done some amazing biomechanical studies and he was one of the people who really drove me. He's no longer with us, unfortunately, along with a lot of my mentors at the Royal Veterinary College. So the proprioceptive system is kind of like a laptop. Now, your laptop and my laptop for movement is in our cortex, in our brain, whereas the dog's main laptop sits in the brainstem. And this already tells us some really exciting information that movement in the dog is organized very, very differently to movement in humans. And for that, we need specific treatment techniques for our wonderful dogs that we share our lives with. So in humans, we have also got a few CPGs and they're central patterning generators, but also known as central processing generators. And these are mini networks. They're like mini computers linked to the main computer. And this is what drives canine gate. Canine gate is an automated system that's innate within the dog, so different to humans. So if you think about when you learn to drive, when you learn to swim, um, when you get dressed in the morning, we have very complex patterns of movement. Dogs don't. Dogs love running. They love sniffing. They need to toilet. They love interacting with other dogs. And their functions and movement patterns are totally different to humans. So when a dog enters water, the dog innately has a program within its computer system to move into a movement pattern. Whereas if you think about when you learned to swim, you had to learn a sequence of events, and then you had to go and do a width. You had parents clapping and you got a badge. But that's quite complicated for us because our movement organization is so different to dogs. Um, that's a good question, Abigail. Uh, Professor McNeil Alexander, if you want to get um, the journals or articles, you can go on to PubMed and you can access it through the internet. Um, and he's written a huge series of amazing articles and um, so has Alan Wilson from the Royal Veterinary College who and Stephen Freen who both inspired me um, to really search and understand dog motion in much more in much greater detail so I could offer a better service and understand the treatment choices that I make for them. So when a dog goes into water the innate patterning is about a survival instinct. They just start moving. Some dogs are more comfortable in water than others. Um, Whereas humans, we organize our movements. So the automated system for dogs is so different to ours. So we're going to have to really think about what kind of movement patterning we do with them. So hydrotherapy to me is about an interaction that's very positive and very beneficial between a therapist and the dog in a body of water. Um, 
And so I kind of think of it as canine Pilates and canine Tai Chi, because the most important thing for me is that I work with the dog. And working with the dog is about not implementing something on the dog, but actually getting them to focus and decide they'll work with you. And what this is called is conscious mediation. And when they do that, their proprioceptive system switches on. So their proprioceptive system isn't on all the time. It doesn't need to be because they're very automatic. So it doesn't come on when they're running across fields. It doesn't come on with all their innate and natural balance activities. It will come on at certain times when you do proprioceptively enriched activities with them. So um, just thinking about um, the design of the dog, if we go back and have a little look, we know from it's a known fact that the hind limbs here, their zigzag shape helps dogs push and push is a much stronger movement than pull. We know that the hind limb is attached here at the sacroiliac joint with a really strong coupling. And what that does is it allows the muscles that are in the rear end, the gluteal mass and the hamstrings to generate power and encourage the dog. It's pushed through the spine to encourage the dog to move forward in a forward motion. The dog is designed to go forward in a forward motion. So the forelimbs are attached with a completely different design. They're attached here through the scapular thoracic joint, which is the scapula, and it's through a big sling of muscle. So the dog is designed to be a rear engine animal, and the forelimb is brilliant at shock absorbing and braking. So the best till last, we've really got to think about the spine. The spine is like the car's drive shaft. It's got amazing muscles either side of it called the epaxial muscles. And the epaxial muscles, we know for a fact, are all about core stability. Whereas before the research came through, people thought they were mainly the extensors of the back. That's kind of a minor role. So they're all about core stability and particularly the caudal core area, which is very important. The ribs give that extra support to the cranial core area. So we need a drive shaft that's strong and straight to easily transmit the muscle power from the gluteals and the hamstrings so the dog can move forward. If the dog has any kind of underlying problem or condition, the dog will move out of its natural balance stance and offload. And what happens is the dog then develops a secondary patterning. So let's go back to that question. Flotation jacket or a harness? So a flotation jacket, think about you in the sea. Put a flotation jacket on you. It's cumbersome. It hampers your natural movement. It gives you gross buoyancy. And if you're in the sea, the tide may move your legs. But what would be interesting is how much muscle activation is actually happening. And if we want to improve movement, and if we want to condition a dog, if we want to rehabilitate the dog, or if we want to be proactive and, and get the dog as fit as it can be for the purpose it enjoys do, doing, whether it's a pet or an athletic dog, it's imperative that we um, turn on the proprioceptive system and it's imperative that we focus primarily on the core. When you put a harness on, it's really important what kind of harness you use. When you put a flotation jacket on, we now know it switches off the epaxials from working effectively. It inhibits that core stability work, so vital for the dog to be able to move efficiently in the way it's designed to do. So think of the flotation jacket you put onto the dog. The moment you put the flotation jacket on, it has gross buoyancy. So as the dog fatigues, the gross buoyancy doesn't change. As the dog moves, it hampers and limits its movement. So you would have to do a huge amount extra than if you actually let the epaxials activate into action. And as a neurophysio, for me, I absolutely know a neuro case, I would never ever put a flotation jacket on it because it would delay progress. So let's have a little look at the next few slides. Our CPGs are what drive gait, that's how a dog moves. So it really matters what kind of harness you use. So we're looking at the most important thing if you're going to use a harness is that it's a Y-shaped harness. 
So I've got it here on the skeleton. So a Y-shaped here where the pad of the harness sits on the manubrium. And the reason that's so important, the top of the sternum, is that that is what we call a key point of control. So key points of control, humans have them and dogs have them. And key points of control are an amazing um, part of therapeutic handling where we can use a sternal handbrake and help the dog find its natural balance. By applying a key point of, a point of control to the sternum in a quiet and focused manner where, the do, where we read the dog's feedback signals and work with the dog, the dog can then find its natural balance, which is so important if you're working in therapy. It's very different to training techniques because training techniques use a really different route from the laptop to the muscles. And we're interested in the main route that dogs use every day for all their activities. So the Y-shaped harness needs to be around the neck and coming down under the sternum. If we use a, a harness, if we use a harness that's not Y-shaped, as you can see here, what we actually do is inhibit natural patterning because what you're doing is you're bringing something across the shoulder. There's lots of designs of harnesses like this. And um, it's really important when you're looking at these harnesses to consider that you're actually um, having a negative effect on the balance movement. So if you have a dog that has this kind of harness style on, they're going to have to compromise their spine and the spinal movement and adapt for it. It's actually restricting protraction, which is the forward movement of the limb. And the very important movement, which is the retraction phase, is the power sweep. So when you're looking at your harnesses that you're using in the pool, there's lots of different makes. It's really the Y shaped is the key thing. And the best thing to do is find the best fit for each dog because they're in so many different shapes and sizes. We want to have in the pool, we want a snug fitting chest strap and a looser back strap. Whereas in the underwater treadmill, when you're using the harness, you definitely want like a lamb based fit, unless you're going to raise the water and use it to swim the dog in like a canal, which a lot of advanced practitioners are doing now. So again, just appreciating how important it is, this Y-shaped harness and looking at the fit. So the Y-shaped harness comes around. It doesn't in any way impinge the movement of the forelimb. And then you've got a chest strap that doesn't in any way impinge on the triceps and it needs to be a well-fitted harness. So whether it's an athletic dog, an elderly dog, um, a working dog, a family pet, looking at, looking at um, the harness, it's the, the reason it's so important with the fit, thank you Mel, why is it important for the back strap not to be too tight? Because what it will do is limit spinal movement. By making it quite snug, you'll actually lift the spine out of its natural conformation and top line for that breed. So, We've got some great pictures here just to show the different ways you could use it. So I've had a few questions and we'll have a look at those in a moment. And my first question came from Richard a long time ago, which was great. Thank you, Richard. Hope you're doing well. And he asked the question about um, what kind of flotation device for water rescue dogs, taking into account the dogs. I think this is really important. We're talking about canine hydrotherapy. We're not talking about roles of the dog. So it's going to be a very different scenario if the dog's going to see with tides. But ideally, the design would not impinge um, the movement of the forelimbs and the hind limbs. And so for the work and activity, the harness would suit that, that role. Whereas we're talking about therapy. And therapy is a, a is a it's a sorry therapy is about I'm very passionate about this because it's very hard that so many people are using flotation devices and I'm sure if they understood that they're delaying the progress of the dog they'd rethink about it. We have used harnesses for the last fifteen years 
and this information has been out there, we really enjoy passing it on and the level three certificate um, qualification for the last 10 years, we've explained the reasons you would never use a flotation device. If you're going to use a Y-shaped harness, you do need to know how to drive that canine car. And that's what we teach on our level three certificate. Some people, when they've got their driving license, then what they want to do is go and advance practice. They may want to do motorway lessons, go on the skid pan. They may want to do an advanced um, series of courses. So, or they may drive different vehicles. So it's really important to plan out what you're offering. But flotation devices, the facts are they inhibit movement. And as a neurophysio and a neurovet physio, I get amazing results in two or three sessions. And if you use a flotation device, you're definitely going to hinder that progress. And that's that's based in science that's been around for 20 years. So I think the next question, is there any instance where you would use a flotation jacket instead of a harness? Thank you, Dave. Absolutely not. And again, we explain why on all our courses. Thanks, Richard, for that. It did throw me a bit because I was trying to look up and see what kind of harnesses they did. Um, that's a really good question, Bethan. Is there a good compromise product with the job for both of them? There really isn't. You need to find a really good fitted Y-shaped harness if you want to empower the dog's movement. The flotation device, if you're not comfortable and you don't know how to balance the dog in water or move the dog in water, use movement shaping or alignment techniques, um, for safety, definitely stay with the flotation device, but it's really exciting to help the dog progress in a few sessions rather than several sessions. You'd like feedback on a neck flotation? Again, we have techniques that we use with our hand positioning to support the head and neck. I think we've had one or two clients ever that we've used any flotation devices around the neck. They're, they're not blown up, they're very small amount of air in them and that's when um, dogs with neck deformities just to prevent them going in the waterline. So for us, it's always about safety. The most important thing is no dog's head ever goes under the water. No dog is ever allowed to take on board water in the pool. No dog ever picks up a toy off the waterline. And what we do is we movement shape the dog through a manual transmission holding the harness and um, with body posturing. So the other thing is that dogs their main way they communicate is body posturing and uh, facial expression. So we use body posturing to communicate directly with them to turn on that proprioceptive system. So I've got some more questions coming in. Why should we override the automatic survival mode of the dog? It's an interesting question because the automatic survival mode of the dog means the proprioceptive system isn't on. So the dog is automated and with that, it's an interesting question why you would feel that we wouldn't have to do that. We want that proprioceptive system on. We don't want the dog surviving an event or being so, um, or pushing its behaviors into flight or fright or fooling around or focus, so focused on the motivator that they can't think about the quality of their movement. So as therapists, we're really interested in improving the quality of the dog's movement. Um, thank you, Mel, for that one. Any more questions coming through? Okay. So I hope that's given you some um, useful information. Um, I'm passionate about dogs, passionate about therapy. And I know it's hard to hear, but when I started in therapy, um, working with dogs about 20 years ago, at that time, dogs were being pole and collared. People weren't in the pool. People weren't in the underwater treadmill. And canine hydrotherapy is really evolving massively. It's so exciting with so many people coming into the industry. Um, we've just had the most amazing group this week. They've been doing their level three in hydrotherapy, a lot of career changes. They're passionate about the dogs and they're so excited to take their new skills to go forward. So if you think about the qualification awarding body, that um, we have, it's ABC Awards. They've amalgamated with CERTA Awards, so they are a major qualification awarding body. They represent the DVLA, and then the level three is your driving license, and lots of people have driving licenses, but some people wish to progress further. So it really reflects on what kind of service that you would like to develop. So it's so exciting with CPD, 
and all the courses out there that we can take choices, plan where we want to go and extend our scope of practice. Um, I think that's all the questions at the moment. So I hope you found that useful. The thing for me, it's all about working with the dog, working together in partnership, getting amazing results and getting them really quickly. And it's fantastic to have worked with so many amazing people this year. We've just done our level five and um, a group of people who wanted to progress pool and the water treadmill as people quite often ask that and I've got some really good research to share with you about that if you want to know more please do send some questions in oh, I've got another question coming in let me just see I don't want to miss anybody's question thank you so much for coming in I'm just coming down to it hi Adam Gib Gibbons hello any brand of harness any better Dawn um Thank you, Jane. That's really lovely. Any brand of harness any better? No, I think it's getting the right harness fit for the right dog. Just like you may uh, try on several pairs of shoes, you'll always get the best fit. So I think it's really useful to have a range of different harnesses, Y-shaped harnesses, so you can get the best fit because it's incredibly difficult to find a good fit for a mini Dachshund or um, a lot of dogs are in between sizes of the harnesses as well. So I'd be looking at that. So hi, Adam, I don't know if you've got a question. I can't see the, the question. Oh, I've got some more here. Can you let me know if we should be lifting the dogs from the top of the harness rather than lift from underneath? That's a really good question, Adam. What we want to do is you want to think of the dog as a car. Um, and what we do when we take the dog up the ramp or down the ramp, we're actually using the ramp as a therapeutic treatment because we want to movement shape the dog up the ramp and we're looking for the dog to enter into the water without stalling the car. So lifting the dogs from underneath depends which way you put your hand. So if you're going to do a lift, you'd want to do lengthways because if you do across the dog underneath, you're going to switch off the paxial muscles. And that's again based in research. Um, lifting the harness from the top, it's not a technique that we use or encourage because we want the harness to have a so the Y-shaped harness to be a snug fit around the dog. So it's kind of like part of the dog so the dog can activate its muscles efficiently. I hope that uh, answers your question. Would you use a collar instead of a harness so the dog's movement isn't limited? No, we wouldn't. We put a collar on the dog on dogs that can cope with collars. Um, there are some situations we would never use a collar. So we would never put a collar, a collar on a brachycephalic breed. We wouldn't use a collar on a dog that's got um, any kind of um, neck issues. Um, we'd never put it on um, a King Charles Cavalier Spaniel if they had stringohydromyelia. But on the main, most of the other dogs will put a collar on as a second point of contact for in an emergency. But we don't put any tension through the collar because we don't want to over-engage the neck. We want the dog to find its natural balance stance, and you can do that with a Y-shaped harness. Because another key point of control for the dog is the neck and the collar and the head, and we don't want to activate that and take the dog out of balance. I hope that helps. I think that's all the questions. Um, I think we're there. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting. If you want to have um, another session and look at between pools and underwater treadmills and also the size of hydro pools, I'm asked that often. It's actually all about the interaction between you and the dog. It's what you do with the dog in the water. It's not the size of your pool. It's not the equipment you're in. It's that positive interaction that gives an amazing benefit for the dogs. And we're all in the industry because we share an amazing passion for dogs. So I think sharing information, getting the message out there is so useful and it will help people to make their choices. But at Canine Hydro Services, we've never used a flotation jacket. I would never advocate it. Um, and we've always taught at all levels from level three up to level seven, the reason we would use a Y-shaped harness because we want to activate the dog's engine 
and we want to be able to improve the dog rapidly in a few sessions. So I hope that's um, answered all the questions for this evening. Really enjoyed talking to you and um, I'll be back soon. Cheerio. Bye.